All right, all right. Marathon 104. 104. That's crazy. I'm just going to jump right into these stories. We've got seven stories in this video. I don't really know how long it's going to be, but I got busy yesterday and last night. And I got as many done as I could. And I hope you guys enjoy it. We're going to do birthday well wishes at the end of the video. I think that's a good compromise. We'll put those at the end of the video. Every one of these stories is great. And I hope you enjoy it. All right, here we go. Here's a story from uh, Kentucky. This is really good. The man wants to stay anonymous, and here's what he writes. I was born in southern Ohio in the mid-1950s, and my parents moved to northern Indiana before I quit wearing diapers. But my dad was from central Kentucky, just north of the Daniel Boone National Forest. When I was nine years old, my dad was injured on his job, and for reasons that I'm still not clear about, he went to his parents' house in Kentucky, where he would soon die. He took five of us kids with him, and my baby sister and my mother would follow very soon. My grandparents' home was out in the sticks, and many sounds could be heard there while sitting on the porch in the evenings. We often heard what was described as wildcats, bobcats screaming just like the sound of a woman. But several times we would hear unusual sounds from the mountains surrounding their home. These were just described as boogers by my uncles who lived with my grandparents. When we heard these screams or sounds, it meant it was time to go inside the house and stay there. If a privy trip was needed out back, it was done by several at a time, but it was done really quickly. A few times they would speak with quiet reverence about bookers and how they had and still at times would enter the home and eat whatever the leftovers were in the bean pot or the slop bucket for the hogs the next day. I once heard them say that you could hear a booger scraping the bottom of a bucket with a spoon or its nails. We were told to lay still and keep quiet if we heard anything entering the house late at night. And on a couple of nights, I could hear the adults talking in whispers about seeing something outside near the window. One night, as my brother and I were laying on a couch in a sitting room just off the kitchen, I heard a noise at the kitchen door, and my brother said he saw something looking in the window. I could not see the window, but I heard whatever it was slam the door open, and we could hear the heavy breathing and the smell. Oh, what a terrible smell, like all the privy had just been brought in with this thing. We heard what was later discovered as a slop bucket being scraped, slurped, and even thrown firmly against a cast iron wood stove and then settled on the floor. After a little snooping around the kitchen, we finally heard this thing leave and most of the smell went with it. Soon after, my grandmother came out of her and Grandpa's curtain-covered bedroom doorway, and she gently closed the kitchen door. Nothing was ever said, but I could hear her praying under her breath. The next morning, I got up early and went out to the privy, passing a small shed where the big black Angus bull spent his nights. I noticed the bull was lying down, and he wasn't breathing. I ran back to tell Grandpa, and when he finally believed me, he came out and discovered the big bull's neck had been broken by being twisted 360 degrees, which was a devastating blow to my grandfather as his bull supplied an extra income in breeding fees. Grandpa and my uncles had to quarter the bull just to get it loaded for burying. My father died a few days later at almost 40 years of age, and we left soon after, heading back to Indiana and away from what was a strange world to us kids. Later in life, in the mid-90s, I went to Kentucky to go deer hunting with my cousin on some property adjacent to the Daniel Boone National Forest. We scouted out a good ridge that even had a couple of caves to access in bad weather. I chose to hunt in a creek bottom while my cousin hunted the ridge, and just as day was breaking, I heard a noise that sounded like something crashing down from the ridge in my direction. 
I mean, trees being broken repeatedly and like a dozer without an engine was putting in a new road. When whatever it was got to the bottom near a trail, it stopped and gave a loud growl that nearly made me wet my pants. At the same time, this thing stopped about 40 or 50 yards away, and several deer were trying to step gingerly over my head while I remained in position on a tree root in a creek bank. After maybe 15 seconds, and it felt like 20 minutes, I could clearly smell the stench of this beast, and my mind went back to the mid-60s and what had happened at my grandparents' house, which was only about 20 minutes away by the curvy country road. Then the beast chose a path leading away from me in a different direction from the deer that it was possibly chasing, but between my cousin and myself. I waited about 20 minutes and left to find my cousin, and I found him examining a newly built path coming down the mountain. I asked if he heard all the commotion, and he simply replied, It's time for us to leave now, and we spoke nothing about that hunt to each other or anyone else since perhaps not as much concerned with anyone not believing us as to worry about having the beast return to us in greater anger later. Man, what a story. I mean, he has an encounter, he has an experience when he's a kid at his grandparents' house, and then many, many years later, 40 years later, he's back in the same area and a Bigfoot walks right over him? Did I read that right? The Bigfoot stepped over his head and kept following some deer. That is insane. What an encounter. Thank you, sir, for sending this. It was a great and exciting story. I appreciate it. Here's a short little story that I got from Cheryl. Cheryl's from Mississippi, and here's what she writes. I'm from Mississippi originally, but I've lived in Oklahoma, Texas, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Since I've discovered the subject of Sasquatch, I'm so sure that they're real. I don't need to see one, believe me. But here is my secondhand story. My mom and her siblings made up a huge family who lived on a plantation in Sunflower County. Mom always called it the Patterson Plantation because there were more daughters than sons in this family. Mom and her sisters always worked with their dad in the field hoeing cotton. The boys were too young. The girls were about 8 to 12 years of age, and they were hard workers. Mom would tell us that when their dad was sick, the girls would go to the field by themselves. They were just carrying on for daddy. The only thing that truly spooked them was the fact that something on two legs would pace them. The girls would be on a dirt road which was flanked on either side by the Sunflower River or the forest. This animal would pace them just out of sight in the forest. Mom said one time they asked my grandpa, Daddy, what is that walking next to us? Mom said that he grinned and said it's just a bunch of squirrels. This went on for a while. It never showed its face. And yes, if it had been a vagrant or an escapee from Parchman, surely he would have been seen at some point. The girls were not the only ones who heard this noise. Mom said other adults in the field would also walk the same direction, and they also heard the noises. But to top this off, my mom's family all lived in a little shotgun house that had two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a living room. The kitchen door was secured by a thumb lock. At night, Mom said, someone would open the kitchen door, walk across the linoleum kitchen floor to their bedroom, All the girls slept in one bed. They would walk around the bed and stroke the girls' heads. Mom says she always wanted to know who was doing this, so the next time it happened, she jumped up and she hit the lights. She wasn't quick enough, though, darn it. Anyway, I just thought I would pass this along before I forget about it. Keep up the good work, signed Cheryl. Well, Cheryl, it's permanently out there on the internet now, and your memory is locked in stone. And that, what do you think that was stroking all those girls' heads? You think it was their daddy? 
you think it was your dad, their dad walking in and just, cause I used to do that with my daughter when they were asleep. I'd just go in and look at my kids and just rub their head. Maybe that's what it was, but that does not explain whatever was tracking them in the woods or along that riverbank when they were walking down that road. But it's a great story and a great memory, Cheryl. Thanks for sending it to us. I know that we all appreciate it. Thanks. Here's a short story from Chris. This is anecdotal stuff, but it's kind of a, it's interesting to me when I get these because uh, they make, they make a lot of sense to me. You, you, anyway, let me just read the story and you'll see why. She writes, my story begins in 1982 or somewhere close to that year. My husband and I lived in the middle of 1700 acres in Northwestern Sonoma County, California. We managed a horse boarding operation with a hundred head of horses and a few head of cattle. The driveway was about a mile and a half long from the pavement to the gate of the ranch. There were locks on all outer gates and some inner gates as well. One night I had gone into town for something and I arrived back at the main gate. I got out of the truck to unlock and open the gate. I drove through and then exited the truck to close the gate and relock it. As I approached the gate to close it, I heard the most god-awful scream I've ever heard. It sounded like a woman being terrorized by something. You have to remember, this is out in the middle of nowhere. It was also really dark out, and the only lights were from my truck. I thought about this event for a long time, looking for an answer as to what that scream was made by. I had no clue, but the hair on the back of my neck stood at attention, and I ran closing and locking the gate, and I sprinted to the open door of the truck and hightailed it out of there. I continued to think about that sound, and I could not find an answer. I knew just about every sound by critters in the area, but this one stumped me for sure. In 2016, my oldest son and I were in an apartment living room watching shows that were all about Bigfoot. I was at my desk multitasking when I heard a scream from the television. The hair on the back of my neck stood up all over again and major goosebumps popped up all over my body. There was a soundtrack playing on the program of Bigfoot Sounds and what gave me this reaction was exactly what I heard 34 years ago. There was absolutely no doubt about it. It had to have been Bigfoot on the hill above the gate. I was totally amazed to learn of this and oh yes, I do believe in Bigfoot. Chris, that's a great story, and we get these all the time. People hear things way back before Bigfoot, you know, was in vogue, and there was a lot of information out there, and they put two and two together, and the evidence just comes forward. I'm so glad you sent this to me because it's really, really interesting. So thanks, Chris. Hope you guys are doing good out there in California. Here's a story from Rick. This is really good. Here's what he writes. While I was in elementary school in 1971, I saw The Legend of Boggy Creek, and I later read Peter Burns' little paperback book on Bigfoot. The North Georgia mountains, especially the Appalachians, are rich with legends and strange stories about boogers. Parents and adults would say, don't go out at night, that's where the booger bears come out, or don't go there, the boogers will get you. The problem was is that nobody would ever tell you what a booger was or how it looked, so we thought it was only a scary story. In the spring of 1973, a game warden went missing overnight and was found on a rural road walking the next morning by a passing car. He was exhausted and confused with his clothes torn and he couldn't remember what had happened. It was later said that he claimed to have seen a tall, hairy creature with a big head and a face like a bull. This story was buzzing around for about two weeks, and suddenly all talk of it went quiet. We think he either quit or the state relocated him. In March of 1974, I was 15 years old. I didn't drink or smoke or anything like that. I was a straight arrow football player and not the type to tell stories. About 8.30 p.m., I was riding in a car with three other guys, and the driver was about two years older than us. We were spotlighting deer, illegally, but not for the purpose of shooting one. 
We were just checking them out. We were going down the main road, and it was barely paved, and it was full of potholes. As we rolled along about 10 to 15 miles an hour, we spotted a buck and two does up on a chest-high red clay bank with bushes and overgrowth partially blocking our view. This was at a four-way crossroads where the very narrow dirt right-hand road led off into a completely deserted forest with no houses. On the left was another dirt gravel road with an old church on the corner. Further down that road were a couple of farms. A river runs down one side that is fed by the Amicalola Falls, which is located at the head of the Appalachian Trail. Ironically, there is an area of the river known as the Devil's Elbow where moonshiners, car thieves, pot growers, and hunters were alleged to have gone missing over the years. This is the same area where the game warden went missing in 1973. I was a passenger in the rear seat and I couldn't really see the deer. We stopped and the guy in front of me got out with a spotlight. It was an old D cell and he shined the deer. Apparently the deer had been running and were tired because they didn't haul butt when we lit them up. About three or four seconds after exiting the back seat, I heard a crack or a pop 45 degrees to my right in the forest. My friend who was sitting next to me heard it and said, oh man, I bet that's a game warden. I said, that's one noisy game warden. He then began urging the driver to get us out of there. About that time came some more noises, like something large moving through the woods. I instantly thought it was a bear because a 500 pounder was killed in our area, but bears are known to be very quiet when walking. So I started saying, let's go, and the hair started standing up on my arms and neck, and I began to feel sick with fear. About that time, about 75 or 80 feet to my right, at a 15 to 20 degree angle, I watched a huge hulking figure cross that road from bank to bank in three forward leaning large steps while swinging its arms. From the sound it was making, it appeared to be approaching the deer, and at the moment, they bolted out of there. Now let's pause for a moment as I'm frozen with fear and it seems like time has slowed down. My friend to the left says, what the hell was that? And now we're both saying, let's go, let's go and have one foot in the car. And then as I look up on the top of the embankment, I see the outline of a figure move slowly to get behind a tree where its face was obscured. My friend with a spotlight starts slowly getting in the car while me and the other dude dive in the back seat. At this time, my older and more stubborn friend pulls out a 22 pistol and says, Who are you? Talk to me or I'm going to shoot. Now we're screaming, Let's go, as he again says, Tell me who you are or I'm going to shoot. I think my friend in front of me still has the light pointed at it over the door, even though he is now back in the car. At that instant, we hear a bang, bang, as the driver shoots up in the air. He immediately throws the pistol down and jumps in the car as we spin out of there sideways. Now I'm shaking all over so bad that my feet are actually tapping and everybody but the driver is talking at once. I don't remember who asked first, I think the guy in front, but he said, what did you see? The driver is silent as we drove until we found a closed gas station and we pulled over. He got out and went to the drink machine and down to Coke, but he still wouldn't talk. Now my friend is driving us all home and it's about 10 p.m. and we're planning to go back the next day to look around in the daylight. We also agreed to tell our families, minus the part, about the gunfire, of course. After we drop off my friend, in the back we're headed to my house. My friend in front says to the driver, Hey man, what did you see? Nothing but silence until we got to my house where my friend in the front says, You saw its face, didn't you? He very quietly said, Um, I sat there for a minute waiting for more, but it was obvious he wasn't talking and it was getting late on that school night. I then had to get out and walk up the long path to the dark backside of the house which sat at the foot of the mountain. When I got inside, my mom noticed that there was something wrong, and her first question was, has somebody been drinking? Now that was all I needed. So as I finally managed to tell my story, my mom replied, huh, it's probably the devil. 
But my dad, who grew up on a farm only a few miles from this incident, sat silent looking at the TV. It was his older generation on both sides of the family who used the term booger. Growing up on a farm, he knew all too well about booger stories and later said that he used to hear the strange screaming sounds in the woods. They always blamed it on the panthers, but they were all hunted and killed by the 1900s. The few other people that I shared this story with laughed and ridiculed me, so I shut my mouth until 1980. The following day, we all headed back, and our driver still wasn't going to talk. We got to the location, and we couldn't find footprints, but we did find broken branches and impressions in the ground. Then we got to the tree where its face was hidden. A prominent crooked limb stuck out and bent upward. I could stand flat-footed and reach the limb with my arm almost extended, and that put the creature at about 7 foot 10 inches or possibly more. We went back two times at night to look, stupid and heavily armed, but found nothing, thank God. About two months later, I was in church and I saw a girl that lived on that same road but closer to the main highway. I told her what had happened and a very serious expression overtook her face. She informed me that it had run across the road in front of her one night while coming home from a football game. She also said that her uncle saw it coming out of his chicken house about a year ago. I sat there silently thinking, oh God, why have you allowed such things to exist? In 1980, a new subdivision was being built near our encounter. A story started circulating that the first resident of the subdivision came home one night to find his back door broken down and his kitchen ransacked. Nothing was stolen. Everything was just destroyed. I didn't know the man, but of all things, he was related to my friend who drove the night of our encounter. Before church one morning, I again asked him six years later if he had seen its face that night, and he nodded yes, and then he looked away. My opinion is that the sight of it really scrambled his eggs, and he didn't want to deal with it. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the vandalized house incident, as that story died quickly, just like the game warden story. For some reason, I told my dad a story that a very peculiar aunt told me at the age of five or six. She and my uncle lived in a house on top of a big hill at the foot of a mountain about seven miles from this incident. She claimed that while rocking on her front porch one night, a large hairy man with a very ugly face came around the corner and stood motionless looking at her about eight feet away. She said that she felt paralyzed with fear and could only cut her eyes to look at it. She was unable to call out to my uncle sitting in the living room behind only a foot away. She claimed that she closed her eyes very tight and began praying, and in a few seconds she opened her eyes and the creature was gone. I remember her saying his face looked like it was hit by a hammer. I asked my dad if she was crazy, to which he replied, folks thought so. Well, being able to share this is therapeutic. Thankfully, we now have a Bigfoot museum about an hour north of me. I correspond regularly with the owner and the staff, and they say every week at least one person comes in to share a story. I was honored to have met both Scott Carpenter and David Pilatus there. I hope my story wasn't too boring. I just wonder how many people from my area have even better stories to tell, but they fear the ridicule. Uh, And he signs it off, Rick. Oh, that's a great story. I love that. North Georgia. I can't remember the name of the the falls there at the start of the Amalachicola or something like that. I've never been able to say that word. But that's a, you know, it's a heavily mountain wooded area. Perfect habitat for Bigfoot. Rick, thanks for that. Thanks for that email. This is awesome. I really appreciate you. Here's an encounter from Central Texas. The author's name is Angela. And here's what she writes. I never dreamt in a million years that I would ever have an experience, let alone speak of it. But I feel comfortable to tell it. The only ones who know about it are my mother, my son, my daughter, and myself, and now you. I am a believer of many things. I believe in the paranormal. I believe that dreams come true. I believe people may have seen something, but a Bigfoot? 
I wasn't sure what to think of this. I wasn't sure until 2015, that is. We moved from Houston to Central Texas, and the way best to describe it was it was a neighborhood, but it was a country version of a neighborhood, where each property was at least an acre, give or take. We had wildlife out there, and I was quite excited to see wild deer in our front yard. And of course, we would hear a bobcat and hear coyotes occasionally. I am a single mom of two beautiful adult children. My youngest girl has a disability. It's like dealing with a giant four-year-old. I'm very close to my mother, and we all decided that we wanted to live together. We moved into a huge four-bedroom manufactured home, and let's just say that we could meet in the kitchen and would be halfway through the house, and basically each side of the home had the privacy of a two-bedroom apartment. One night, I was outside with my son walking one of our German shepherds. I adore German shepherds, and we have three of them, and a pit bull puppy, and they're all rescues. Good for you. I love people who rescue dogs, Angela. We spent a lot of time outside. One of the gentlemen that used to live around the neighborhood stopped in the road, and he told us that we shouldn't be out there in the night. In his words, there's a big animal that roams around here. We assumed that he was either messing with us or he was talking about a big coyote or even a mountain lion that had been seen in the town next to us. My son and I said, thank you, but I think we'll be okay. He said, trust me, you won't be if this thing comes out. At that point, we knew he was being overdramatic. Maybe he was even drunk. One night, my son was out, and I was in the kitchen having a cup of coffee with my mother and talking about some plans we had the following day. My daughter came in and announced that she saw a big man looking in her window. We assumed that she had been dreaming, and we treated it like that. She said, no, Mom, it was a big man outside, and he was looking in. It's a monster man. My mother mentioned that my son had been allowing her to watch scary movies while he was supposed to be watching her, and now she was having nightmares. So I asked, what did the monster look like? And she said that he had red eyes that glowed and long hair on his face, that he looked really scary. Well, none of that made sense, but she slept with her grandmother that night, and all was quiet. My daughter attends a school for adults with disabilities. My mother had taken her there the next morning, and I asked my son if he had allowed his sister to watch a scary movie. He said, no, Mom, I would never do that. I told him what she said, and my son became concerned and looked around the house and under the window, but we found no evidence of anything being there. Four nights later, while my son was out walking our shepherd, he caught a horrible odor in the area. We assumed it was a septic tank, but my son said the odor was much worse than that. Suddenly, the dogs began to growl and pace around at the front door. They wanted out. They did this when they knew deer were in the yard, and I was afraid they were going to start barking and annoy us for the next hour. But they never did bark. They acted different than when a deer was close. Their hackles were raised, and they were all growling, a really strange growl. I had never heard them do this. I pushed past the dogs to look out the window, fully expecting to see deer in the yard. But instead, I saw what looked like a giant man. It took a step forward, and it triggered the motion lights on the front of the house. And there it was, fully illuminated in the glow of the security light. I could not speak or move. I think my mouth was hanging open trying to speak, but I couldn't form the words. My son was beside me looking out the adjacent window. He immediately reached for me and pulled me away from the door and closed everything up and then he checked all the locks. My mom yelled and said to call the police and my response was, what are we going to say? What do I say, mom, that a monster was in my front yard? My son had left the room and soon he returned loading his grandfather's deer rifle. And then we heard a gunshot in the distance and everything got quiet. We never went out to investigate, and that night was a fitful night of sleep. Not much of us got any sleep at all. 
And I don't know what got into the dogs, but for the rest of the night, they stayed away from the front door. Maybe they recognized the odor, or maybe they knew what this thing was. But they were not interested in going out. Still today, they will not go out into the front yard, only out back where they are inside a fence. The following day, we ran into that strange neighbor my son and I had seen that one night and had stopped by. And he said, I told you that thing was big, didn't I? And I asked, what was that thing? And he said, you saw it, didn't you? You know what it was. And then he drove away. It was really weird. After that night, we never saw it again. There are times when I think it was near, though. The dogs always let us know when something was not right. News reports were on TV about Bigfoot sightings in Central Texas soon after this happened, and they continued sporadically for a year. Even after seeing the creature that night, and then backed up by the strange man and the news reports, I still had a hard time believing that it was a Bigfoot. I rationalized that it was a prank, we live in a college town, and maybe, I thought, some local kids were just playing a joke. But I remember how big this thing was, every bit of eight to nine feet tall, and it was very broad in the shoulders. And there were those red eyes. They were not fake. They were real. I don't know any college kids that are eight or nine feet tall, so I ruled that out. The reports I saw on the local news and on the internet began to concern me, and I began to believe that it was a Bigfoot. We have become believers since then. We didn't stay there much longer. Within a year, we moved away. Not because of the Bigfoot. We made the decision to get closer to the city for my daughter and my mother. I have not discussed this with anyone outside the family. This is the first time that I have made the event known. It feels good to get it off my chest, but I will admit that as I type this, the memories and panic of that night are flooding back. My hands are shaking here on the keyboard. It was all so shocking, and then when I saw my son walking in the room loading that rifle, I knew things were serious. After careful thought, though, I do not think the creature meant us any harm. It made no aggressive gestures towards us. I think it may have been passing through or just wandering, and our yard provoked its curiosity. Thanks for allowing me to share my story, signed Angela. Angela, whoa, great story. I'm kind of curious if you've heard of any more activity in that area. I don't think you moved very far from where all this happened. If there's been any more activity, let me know. All that said, this is a great story. This thing lights up in the security light, and you see it just full on. You saw red eyes. You saw how big it was. It's a great description of the creature, the way you feel about it, and how you kind of came to grips with what this thing really was. Angela, you did a great job. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Here's a good one. The writer wants to stay anonymous. Uh, he said, I want to share my encounter with you because I feel it is a little different to the usual encounter. I've shared this with friends and authorities in my area, and I was met with laughter or sarcasm, so I'm sharing with you, hopefully your followers, to see if anyone has experienced something similar. I will start off by saying I live in the UK. Hey, I, you know, I hardly ever say hi to my friends in the UK. A lot of people actually watch these over in England, and I, I really appreciate you guys. I know I always put my videos out at six or seven Central Standard Time in the U.S., and that's like midnight or one o'clock in the U.K., but I probably, uh, every once in a while, I probably should release one, I don't know, earlier in the day so you guys can catch them when they're released, but I mean, not that, not that anybody really wants me to release, I, I, you know what I'm saying, I, I'll just shut up. Anyway, watching your videos, it is apparent that there are not a lot of Bigfoot encounters from the U.K., I'm from the West Midlands area, and I have rarely heard of similar sightings. I work as a family social worker, and I specialize in families who are homeless and have difficulties with mental health. While studying near the end of my university degree, I asked to have an assignment where I would live a period of 18 months in homelessness in order to further my career and knowledge. It was during this year that I had my encounter. 
It started off with leaving technology and luxuries behind me and had a meeting with family and professionals before leaving. I went to the large forest area and was not so local to my area as it was further away from society. I would venture most days into a nearby village and look for odds and ends, chores that I could do for people to earn some sort of scrap or charge of food. I tried to do the best that I could for what little I had. I had heard of some weird sightings of what was a bear, which are not wild or native in the United Kingdom, or a community of homeless people around the forest, but nothing solid, and I had not experienced anything myself. I managed to get some stuff together from the money that I had been given for mowing a lawn. I bought a large piece of tarp and some bits of what I assume was a ripped gazebo and had fashioned this into a makeshift tent. I made a shower out of a bucket with holes that I poked in the bottom. It had been a few months of living in the forest and I was going through a normal day-to-day routine of fetching water from a nearby brook and hanging it in a tree to shower and then I noticed a dead badger. The body was fresh and clean and it had no wounds. So I took the opportunity to take it back to my tent and prepare it for a meal. Badgers have been known to be vicious and aggressive, but this is the first of any badgers that I had ever seen. After a few days, I noticed something else weird while I was walking to the brook. There was a rabbit carcass and some apples from what looked like to be from an apple tree not far from my tent. They weren't very nice, though. The weird thing was, this happened for a few weeks and the food or the animals were always in the same spot around 20 feet from my camp. A few weeks passed and I began to feel that this was rather odd and I was unsure if I was being watched. I made my way to the brook to collect some water and get ready to make my way to the village. I walked out past the spot where I had usually found these items, and there was nothing there. So I moved on and thought nothing of it. I could hear the wildlife around me and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I hoisted the bucket of water onto my shoulder and I walked back to the tent. I was approaching the small clearing where my camp was when I noticed it. There was a large figure crouched near a small tree a little ways past my destination. I'm six foot tall and I weigh 16 stone and I could see this thing was just going to be a towering mass over me. I tried not to acknowledge it and ignore it as I carried on doing my business. I left the bucket of water by the fire to warm up while I prepared some food. It wasn't much, but it was what I had left over from some fish and bread, and I had a few carrots. I noticed the being standing up straight and slowly take a few steps toward me. As big as this thing was, I did not feel a threat at all. It looked like a Bigfoot, but not one that I had heard described before. It had hair covering most of its body, but was rather thin around its arms. Its chest was bare and its face was clear. It had dark brown hair, small gray patches scattered all over its body. It was holding what looked like a bunch of blackberries and some wild garlic. Not a normal lunch that I would have, but I'm not going to argue with a Bigfoot. It took around 40 minutes of me dosing around the camp for this thing to get within a couple of yards of me. It placed the food on the ground and it stepped back. I had no idea what to do. I sat down on the camp chair and I began to eat. I picked up the berries and the garlic and I put them in my lap. I ripped the garlic leaves into shreds and put them in my fish sandwich. It was then I decided to gesture to the creature to take a sandwich as a thanks for bringing me some food. It came over to me and it slowly reached out with its huge hand. It looked like it was missing the tip of its index finger. As it took it out of my hand, it let out a sharp but powerful grunt, and then it quickly walked away. After about 10 feet, it stopped and it sat down on an old rotten log and it ate the sandwich. I've got to be honest, when it came over to me, I have never been more terrified in my life, but it remained calm and gentle the whole time. During this little session of what seemed like forever, I had a closer look at it. Its hair or its fur was brown with a large black patch covering its back 
and gray speckle patches all over. It was muscular and had an odd but not too potent smell. Its face was almost Neanderthal looking, but with some ape-like features. It had a protruding bottom lip, and as it opened its mouth to take a bite, I could see very pronounced canine teeth. Its ears were large but almost flush to its head, and this animal must have been eight foot tall and weighed almost double what I weighed. It was incredible. I now assume that it was a male after watching your videos, and I've heard people describe what were breast on female Bigfoots. And I thought to myself, I can't believe that I'm seeing. I think this is a Bigfoot. Man, I did not know what to do. Its arms and hands were covered in small scars and scratches, which look like cat or dog marks, but I wasn't sure. After it finished the food, it stared at me for a while, and then it stood up. I carried on what I was doing, and I hung the bucket of warm water in the tree, and I got ready to shower. As I looked around over my shoulder, the creature had gone. This was the last time that I saw it. I carried on living homeless for the remainder of that 18 months, and didn't come across the creature again. I didn't feel scared or worried or threatened, in fact, it gave me a sense of safety. It left me food every so often in the spot, and I, in return, left a sandwich, sometimes made with some of the things it left me, just to show my appreciation. A few months had passed, and I still hadn't seen the animal again in the flesh, but I felt it around me. I had at this point planted some potatoes in a patch nearby, and today was the day that I would harvest them. I was rummaging through the ground digging up the potatoes when I heard a grunt. I looked up and I saw a boar. Boar are known in the local area and wildernesses, and they're not friendly. This thing grunted and scraped its hoof against the ground very aggressively. I grabbed the trowel next to me, even though this boar wouldn't even feel it if I poked it and it charged me. And then the worst happened. It lowered its head and it charged. My heart stopped and I lost my breath as a loud, deep, howling roar echoed from a distance. It was so deep the echo reverberated off the trees. The boar suddenly skidded along the ground, almost falling before squealing and then running off. My body just emptied of sweat. Thankfully, this is the most dangerous thing that I felt like I encountered, and thank God the big guy was nearby. I've spoken to people about this, and almost no one takes me seriously. However, I know what I saw. I always use this experience in my professional life. By quoting, there are always forces in the universe that will help you if you need it, or even don't expect it. Just be kind to give back when you can. I haven't heard anything described quite like this and was wondering if there are variations of what we know as Bigfoot that are different in different regions. Thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy reading this story. Oh man, that was a great story from the UK. We don't get many stories from the UK. If you guys have any others that, if you've had any experiences over there, I, I, we've gotten a few from England and I think a couple from Scotland. I've never gotten one from Ireland. So I would love to get more and from Europe, any anywhere over in that area from, you know, mainland Europe, just uh, Asia, Russia, I don't care. So I mean, I love these stories. I don't care where they happen. This is one from the UK and it makes perfect sense to me. You know, there are wooded places left in the UK and there's, uh, you know, we have store, we just interviewed a guy who had ran into a Bigfoot in a little bitty patch of woods. It's like 30 yards square. He walked in there and there was a Bigfoot standing there. His 12-year-old kid had a 410 shotgun. He walked right up on a Bigfoot while he was rabbit hunting in a little bitty patch of woods. So, I mean, these things can live anywhere, and apparently they know how to stay concealed. And why couldn't they do that in the U.K. as well? Great story. Thanks for sending it to me. I got it about a year ago. Still reaching back and getting some stories. I really appreciate it. Great story. Thank you. This is a good story. The writer uh, wants to keep his name out of it. And here's what he writes. On a Friday in August in 1976, school was about to start. I was helping some friends of my parents do some yard work. They had recently bought the house and there was a lot of work to do. 
My father must have told them that I needed some work, so they asked if I would help do the job. I didn't know them, but I was willing to do whatever to make some spending cash. At that time, I was 17 years old. School was about to start, and some cash in my pocket was always needed. That morning, I rode my motorcycle to their house, and at the end of the day, storms began to gather. I stayed put waiting for the rain to stop, and I got to know the couple a little better. The house sat on 50 acres with woods and bean fields on three sides of this property. At the corner of the property, the owners had planted a field for wildlife, a food plot. While we waited for the rain to stop, we sat on their back porch and watched the deer through field glasses. The rain had the deer moving. The owners went inside to clean up and I stayed on the porch and watched the field. When I looked through the binoculars again, the deer were gone and I saw three huge brown figures in the food plot. They were 300 yards from me and there was no way to make out the details. However, from what I could make out, they appeared to be walking on two legs. The binoculars came away from my face and then back again and again. I was trying to clear my eyes and make sure that I was seeing what I was seeing. What was I seeing? A few minutes later, the man walked out asking how many deer I could see, and I immediately asked him if cattle were being put out anywhere around his property. He said he didn't know of any. Matter of fact, he knew no one in the area raised cattle. Raising the field glasses to my eyes again, the animals were gone. I only saw the green of the field. It was still raining, but it looked as if it would stop soon and I could be on my way. But I kept surveying the field. This whole thing was really strange. If I held the binoculars really still and if I concentrated on one spot, I could just make out the shape of a large upright creature inside the woods. The image I saw was an upright human-like creature standing on two legs. Only the shape. There were no details. They were tucked into the shadows of the trees. And to the side, I caught some more movement, and I shifted the field glasses to see another one. And then I shifted my gaze back to the first, only to have lost it. This went on for 30 minutes or an hour. These things looked like the Bigfoot images that I had seen in books and on television, just like a Bigfoot. The rain finally stopped and it was getting dark, but I kept looking through those glasses. I'm sure the couple wondered what I was doing. Eventually, they came outside and asked if everything was okay, and I told them it was. I laid the binoculars on the table. I then blurted out, Do you mind if I walk down to your food plot and look around? Well, don't you need to get home, they asked. Yes, sir, but I think I saw a big buck down there, and I want to see if I can find his tracks. I was lying. Sure, go ahead. We're leaving to go meet some friends for dinner. You let yourself out. And then they left. I turned and walked to the field. It was a long way. I had to see this. When I was close to the trees, I immediately heard something walking in the leaves just inside the trees. I could hear branches breaking and leaves shuffling. What do I do now? Should I go further? Something big was definitely in there. I admit it shook me up, so I backed away and I made it back to the house and I drove home. But before I left the area, I found several perfect tracks of huge bare feet in that new mud. That morning, the field had been dust. Now it was soft, slippery mud. I knew those tracks had just been made. I got home and I wanted to say something to my father that night, but what was I going to say? I made it home, I got cleaned up, and I went out with some friends. Those images were on my mind all night. I was distracted while I was with my friends, and one of my buddies asked me what was on my mind. I actually broke down and told him the story. He was blown away. We have to go see what this was, he said, and suddenly I was excited. I wasn't going in there alone, but I would go if someone else went with me, and the plans were made. I would pick him up at 6 a.m. and we would go check it out. The next morning at 6.30 a.m., we were parked on the other side of this stretch of woods, opposite to the house that I had worked on the day before. We found a graveled area to park at, and in the low light of the morning, we walked into those woods. 
Within 20 or 30 paces, we knew we were being watched and tracked. Footsteps in the leaves were clearly audible. This made us both nervous, but we kept walking. My plan was to walk straight through this patch of woods to the field where the food plot was. Something was tracking us all the way there. We never saw anything, but we knew something was there with us with every step. We were approaching the edge of the field, and light was shining into the woods from the east. There were these strange, uniform openings in the leaves of the trees about eight foot or nine feet off the ground, perfectly round spaces that were illuminated by the light coming through. We looked at them closer, and I could see woven branches into almost perfect 18-inch circles at about eight feet off the ground, and the leaves and green branches of the trees had been woven into them. They made a sort of porthole through the canopy. I think these were observation holes so that the creatures could watch the field and remain concealed. It was amazing. In the field, we saw several tracks in the mud and grass. Perfect impressions of huge bare feet that looked human, but they were three times as big as a human's foot. I could not believe what I was seeing. We eased down the tree line, and we were followed the whole way. Crunch, snap, crunch of the leaves mimicked every step we took. I asked my buddy what he thought about going back through the woods to our car. He shrugged and said, well, let's go. So back into the forest we went. I don't know what we were thinking. Maybe it was youthful curiosity or maybe we were just stupid. But I will admit that I'm still a bit that way. Curiosity usually wins over fear with me. Taking a different route back, we saw a lot of tree and branch manipulation. Tree limbs snapped off and hanging, still attached to the trees with fibers or bark. Some were three to four inch trunks bent over or snapped off and laid in deliberate locations, and they seemed to form a path. I could see it as I lined them up with my eye, and we followed the tree breaks. What happened next is something that I have never heard of regarding Bigfoot. Now, I'm not a student of the creature by any means, just a casual interest due to this encounter. But in the few encounters that I've heard or read, never once has anyone said that they found a Bigfoot bathroom or an outhouse, but that is exactly what we walked into. In a small opening in the midst of that forest was an area so covered in poop that it looked as if it had been dumped from a truck and then scattered about. Poop was in piles. Poop was splattered on tree trunks and all over the vegetation in this area. Perfect tracks were everywhere. Some of the tracks were in the piles of scat. There was one low, thick limb jutting from an oak tree that was only five or six feet from the ground. Under this branch was a big pile of poop. They had been sitting on this branch like a human would use a toilet. We could hardly catch our breath over the smell of feces and stale urine. Flies swarmed the area in a frenzy. There would be no way for you to imagine how much poop we saw under that tree limb. I could elaborate, but I won't. My only conclusion is that these things have a very active digestive system. Man, it was bad. I had to get out of there, and we kept moving. Finally, away from the buzzing of insects around this Bigfoot sewage dump, we could hear our stalkers again, keeping step with us in the woods, never seeing anything but always knowing they were there. Maybe we were heading in the wrong direction or towards an area that they did not want us, but whatever the reason, these creatures started screaming at us. It seemed as if the woods were full of these things and roars and screeches came from a long distance away. The creatures that were nearer to us and surrounded us made lower, less ominous noises, mainly grunts and growls, but the farther we walked, the more agitated they seemed. It was time to go. I knew where we were in relation to our car, but I didn't know how far. I turned us in the direction of safety, and we picked up the pace. 
I think we walked close to the turd yard again because the smell was getting stronger, and then it finally let up. Thank God we didn't have to walk back through there again. But we picked up our pace to a jog. We picked up our pace to a jog and had traveled for about five or ten minutes. When 20 feet in front of me, I saw a dark figure slither through the leaves while almost flat to the ground. It circled around to my right and it shot back between us behind me and in front of my buddy. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. My buddy didn't see it until it was 10 feet directly in front of him and moving from his right to his left. I won't repeat what he said, but let me assure you that he was quite startled. We stopped dead in our tracks and we watched this thing slither or belly crawl to a tree and then it stood upright behind a large tree trunk. And then it poked its head from around the trunk and it looked right at us. It was only three or four feet tall, small compared to the image I had in my mind as it plowed through the leaves moving between us. I assumed this was a toddler, and I knew if we were to seem like a threat to this young one, we were in big trouble. Mama had to be close by. I looked back at my partner behind me only to see him pick up a stick and throw it at this thing. While I remained completely silent and calm, in my mind, I was screaming, What in the hell is he doing? He later explained that he wanted to see it run. What an idiot. Let's go, I said, and he and I started running in the line that we had previously set to the truck. Ten to fifteen steps into our run, right in front of us, an adult Bigfoot stood in our way. Mama had been watching us with her baby. Apparently, it had been there the whole time, and we had been distracted by the baby Bigfoot, or it had moved in front of us while the idiot was throwing sticks at its child. I stopped cold in my tracks, and ten feet away, a giant stood there heaving and watching me. I looked right at its face and into those black eyes for several seconds. This probably sounds strange, but the thought entered my mind that they had not harmed us yet. They could have if they wanted, but so far, they had allowed us to walk through their area injury-free and alive. In addition, as I looked into the black eyes of this ancient creature, I got the sense there was not ill will between us. A calm feeling came over me. I felt like waving to it, but I thought better of it, and I stepped forward to the side, and me and Stick Boy walked right past this creature only ten feet away. Now, that's not 10 yards away. That's 10 feet away. That was very close. The creature's eyes and body followed us. And in a minute, we were both looking behind us, watching and hoping that it would not attack. The attack never came, and we were headed to the car in safety. The walk to the car was longer than I estimated. It took us maybe 30 minutes to reach the edge of the woods, and we were tracked the whole way, but this time we could see our escorts. I know I saw three shapes in the distance keeping pace with us. It was now 9 a.m., and the sun was shining fully. The woods were now lit, and I could see daylight at the edge of the field where we had parked. Only a few more yards, and we were home free. I stopped short of the field and I turned to get one more look at these magnificent creatures, but the woods were still other than a few leaves gently moving in the breeze. They were all gone. My buddy and I were talking the whole time. We never made an effort to be quiet. Again, I won't repeat what we said, but it was more or less, can you believe this, with about 500 profane words to clutter the air around us. We were teenage boys. We broke through into the field, and there was the car just as we had left it. On each side of the car, a tree had been bent to the ground, not blocking our way, and not a branch of the tree laid on the car. The trees made a perfect slot as if it were a parking spot. I closed the door, turned the ignition, and the engine started, and we were headed home. My friend and I graduated high school that next May. We went off to different schools and eventually moved back to our hometown. We are still best of friends and good business associates. 
We have lunch every Thursday at the same local diner in our small Mississippi town. We talk about that day maybe about once a year. What else is there to say? We both saw this, and we know no one's going to believe us. And then one of our boys from Mississippi started telling these stories on the Internet. We figured we could trust you with this, Cam. So there you have it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. In 1998, that land went up for sale. I figured if it got sold, whoever bought it would sell the hardwood off of it. So I bought it and another 500 acres around it, and no timber will be cut as long as I'm alive. Half of the land is leased to farmers. No hunting is allowed. I keep the food plots growing, but I don't hunt over them. My friend and I go into those woods a few times a year, sometimes together and sometimes alone. We leave a bag of apples, a few fresh ears of corn, maybe some hard candy left over from the holidays. I still get that calm feeling when I'm in there, and it's a good place to be. <laughs> what a story! Woo! I'm not going to say anything else. I'll just mess it up. Great story, man. I really appreciate you sending it to me, and I actually know this guy. I know who he is. <laughs> he... He's a very successful business guy, and his he and his family have done really well. And his buddy, I know his buddy, and they've all done really well. And I had no idea. I had no idea they had had this experience. I got this email, I don't know, maybe maybe about a month ago, and I just uh, I kind of struggled whether whether where to sh whether to share it or not. But uh, I decided I'd go ahead and do it. So uh, I don't think anybody's going to put it together who he is. But anyway, it's a great story, and I thought I'd share it with you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, birthday wishes, birthday wishes in August. First, we have Kaysen. Kaysen is going to be eight years old on August the 21st. Kaysen, your Aunt April says that you really like these videos, and I, I really appreciate it. I can't believe kids like these videos. She says, you really like that turkey story I did a few months ago where the guy said he was a coward at heart. <laughs> I got so tickled at that, and I think uh, I think people were laughing with me. But And I should have taken it out of the video, but I thought, oh, it's just so funny, you know. And the whole line caught me by surprise, and that's why it was so funny. But Kaysen, uh August 21st, he's going to be eight years old. Your Aunt April says, happy birthday, buddy. Have a great, great day on August 21st. Next, we got John. John's 70th birthday is on August the 10th. John lives down on the Gulf Coast. John, your fiance is looking forward to seeing you. She sent me an email and said to tell you happy birthday. Next, we have Brooklyn. Brooklyn turned to 13 on August the 10th. Happy birthday, Brooklyn. Your grandmother, Lisa, loves you, and she says happy birthday, too. I'm sure she's already said it since your birthday's already passed, but there you go. Happy birthday, Brooklyn. Happy birthday to Mike and Angie Gorowski. Both of them have the same birthday on August 16th. I assume that they're twins. Your brother, James, says happy birthday. I don't know how old you guys are. I hope August 16th is a great day. I'm recording this on August the, uh, let me look at my watch, 13th, so that's three days away. I hope your birthday's a great day for you, Mike and Angie. Jeff Faulkner in Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia. His birthday was August the 11th. Your wife, Jen, says, happy birthday, Jeff. Man, what a good woman you got. Thinking so much of you to send me an email and tell you happy birthday. You take care of her, man, and happy Hope you had a great day on the 11th. And then last, we've got Ken in Georgia. Ken's going to be 74 years old on August the 21st. Your wife, Jamie, says happy birthday. She says you all have been married for 45 years. And that's what I'm talking about. In an age where marriage is disposal, some people stick it out and they do it all the way. Ken in Georgia, happy birthday on August the 21st. That's coming up pretty quick. And I hope your day is awesome. So that's all the happy birthdays. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks.